Good morning, and I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 645, and you will find Proverbs 22 right there, and you can join with us in reading this. Uh, hey, welcome to our family service, continuing our series called How Not to Be an Idiot, and today we're talking about parenting. And by the way, I'd remind the children that we shouldn't call people names like no, idiots no. Uh, and things like that. And the Bible doesn't actually use the word idiot. It uses the word fool. That's kind of our translation, our change. And a fool is the opposite of wise. Uh, and, and because Proverbs is a book written by a dad to his sons on how to be wise and smart and successful and not an idiot, we're using that term, how not to be an idiot. And uh, since this is family weekend, I've got some help uh, this weekend sharing the message. So I've got Pastor O.C., uh, our family pastor. So he's here. And, Hi, Pastor O.C. And then o. Julie, Julie Garnis is our director of uh, Calvary Kids. Hello. And she's, uh, she's here to share with us as well. Pastor Chad, we thought it would be fun to share some family pictures today. Oh, because it's family weekend? Yeah. Oh, yay. So I brought the only normal family picture we have in my family. This Julie is my... the model. <laughs> oh, right. Well... It's really photoshopped. <laughs> um, this is my husband, Brandon, and our children, Layla and Sawyer, and they're seven and nine years old. And then we have one from Pastor O.C. There's Aww. my family, my wife, Jana, and my six-year-old son, Knox. And, and his dimples. His dimples, yes. And what you don't see in the picture, because this was taken before it happened, is my wife is pregnant. So um, you don't Yay! see it here, but this picture will change in about nine months. <laughs> <laughs> Trust and then, me, Pastor they, Chad, we have a nice, oh, normal one of yeah, you, too. Yeah, our family, yeah. Our, our wedding photo from yeah. December. Yeah. So, and, and then uh, I thought we'd bring in a special one for you. Yeah. <laughs> I resemble that guy. <laughs> I think I used to know him. Yeah, maybe we should take that so, off the some screen. Of, some, of, uh, some of them used to know that guy, too. Uh, I'd, I'd make a comment about your hair, but I know that's only going to come point? back on me. So. <laughs> Wait, you would make a comment <laughs> right. about hair? <laughs> Uh, so uh, here's a question. What did you want to be when you were a child? You know, when you were eight years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, take a moment and share that with the people around you. Ready, set, go. What did you want to be when you were eight years old? I know you guys can say you didn't remember eight, but, but there's a lot of you who uh, wanted to be stuff. There are kids out there. All right, parents, if you got your kids with you, make sure you tell your kids what you wanted to be when you were their age. So, all right, so uh, Julie, what did you want to be when you were eight years old? I wanted to be a veterinarian until I took a trip to the veterinarian's office for a few hours and saw some surgeries. And they were not nice ones. They were very <laughs> weird for a 10-year-old to see. And I never wanted to step foot in a veterinarian's office ever again. <laughs> okay. So, O.C., what would you want to be? I wanted to be a doctor. But then I realized that you had to go to school and you had to get a master's degree. And so instead, I went to school and got a master's degree to be a preacher. I, it same didn't work out. School, yeah, same amount of school, a whole money. lot of less money. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and what, what about you, Pastor Chad? What did you want to be when you grew up? When, when I was eight, I wanted to play basketball on the NBA. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. But uh, I realized that uh, being deceptively slow and having a three-inch vertical leap probably wouldn't serve me well. <laughs> so probably I thought I'd do not. something that I didn't stink at. So. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> yeah. So now, parents, here's the, here's the flip side of that question. What, when you look at your children, the young ones or your grandchildren, what do you want them to be when they grow up? Now, see, most of the time when we ask that question, we ask some parents, what do you want your kids to be when they grow up? They answered, instead of giving jobs, they answered with words like godly, happy, successful, responsible, healthy, functioning, mature. Uh, and to be blunt, that is the goal of parenting. The goal of parenting. Uh, Proverbs 22.6 says this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, parents, we want wise, not foolish children. We want to raise godly, happy, successful, responsible kids. Uh, we want to see our kids and our grandkids grow up to be that. So uh, 
Proverbs 22 shares the principle of wise parenting. Not the promise, but the principle. Uh, and, and so we're sharing principles of wisdom, not direct promises. Now, as we share this today, uh, we just want to make the disclaimer, we are not perfect parents. We don't have perfect families, uh, perfect marriages, any of that kind of stuff. But we are people who love families, who want to see families be healthy and thrive and grow. We're working hard at that in our own lives. Uh, and so we want to share with you uh, the wisdom of Proverbs and how it meets our lives and what we find really helpful. So uh, Julie and, and O.C., uh, you guys want to raise godly, happy, successful kids. Uh, yes. So what do you find important or helpful, Julie? I find it very helpful to actually say what you said earlier, that I am not perfect. I am not the perfect parent. I need help sometimes more than more days than others. And I don't know all of the perfect parenting strategies. I find it very helpful to admit that and a actually ask for help whenever I can and whenever um, I'm surrounded by people that I trust. Um, one place that I try not to go to is Facebook. Facebook does not have all of the perfect parenting strategies to um, give. And I know, <laughs> I know it's a shocker. And also in Super Nanny, she doesn't know your family or your children. They're all different and unique. So um, admitting that you need help and asking for advice. Also, in my situation, I am married and I find it extremely helpful to put my spouse as a priority. That means I make sure to attend to his needs, even if it's over my children. Did you hear me, kids? <laughs> if, if we know, and so do my children know, that if we do not have <clears throat> a healthy marriage, it's gonna trickle down to our children. So I find that very, very helpful. And one more thing is, we love, love, love our life group, and we see it be, being very helpful, even in our parenting, being surrounded by people that we trust, and we're opening the door for people to speak into our lives since they see us on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. All right. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate that. O.C., what about you? Um, for me, raising a, a healthy son, uh, spiritually happy, success, uh, successful, um, it's twofold. I think, first off, it's, living the life that I claim that I want to live. You know, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, and so we try to do as best we can in our home to live out a Christ-like example. So things like, um, I try to do what I say. What I talk about, I try to match with my actions. Uh, I'm also very honest with Knox and with Jana. Um, we have a very honest, open relationship uh, within our home, um, which means I also apologize regularly. Um, Surprise, surprise, I'm not perfect, despite what many of you think. Um, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> um, My tongue hurts. Right. <laughs> but for me, um, apologizing is teaching my son that being an honest person and apologizing when he does wrong, it's teaching him that that's the godly be a godly behavior. Um, and, and we also practice self-control. Uh, it's the last of the fruit of the Spirit. If you uh, read through the fruit of the spirit. The last one mentioned is self-control, and that's a big deal in our house. We do not make decisions or discipline Knox in our anger or when we're emotionally charged. We make sure that we uh, approach those situations level-headedly. Um, also, uh, the second part is we continually talk about Jesus in our home. Um, we look for opportunities to talk about biblical things and to mention Jesus, to, to pray, to pray for people, um, but it's not forced. And I, I have a confession to make. We do not do a nightly or morning Bible study as a family. Um, we tried it. It did not work. It was awkward. It, Knox did not enjoy it, um, and it was damaging his relationship with Christ. And so we just look for opportunities, just like Deuteronomy 6 tells us to do. We look for opportunities all the time to talk about Christ and to uh, teach him Christ and biblical examples that he sees in the world around him. So those are the two things that I think are, are our model mm -hmm. for raising a godly son. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, amen what you guys said, echo it, reinforce it, because those are great principles. Uh, I'm just going to add to that, do spiritual life together. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, do mission trips, mission projects, service projects together as a family. And, and I look out here, and there's a lot of grandparents in this, uh, in this room. And if you're still healthy enough, 
get with one of your grandkids and, and do a mission trip with them. Take them on one of ours or, or you know, find their church and, and say, hey, let me send you on this mission trip because that's uh, just a great way to build up their life. Uh, send them to camp. Uh, encourage them to go to youth camp and, and children's camp and all those different kinds of things and then make attendance a priority. Uh, you know, we just encourage parents to have your kids in church on a regular basis. There's only 52 weeks during the year and, and you're bringing them into the presence of God with other believers, letting them uh, have that instruction and that encouragement to walk in faith by other people. Uh, and, and I just got to ask parents, what do you allow to take priority over worshiping God? You see, we, we want to raise wise children, godly, happy, successful kids. Uh, Pastor O.C. has a great illustration using some chairs uh, that we want to show you this morning. So I have three chairs up here, uh, and each chair represents a different type of spiritual home, okay? Um, the first one is what we're calling committed. And the committed home is the family that goes to church regularly, they talk about God, but most importantly, they practice what they preach. They live like followers of Christ. They are doing their best. They're not perfect, but they're doing their best to be followers of Christ in the way they speak, in the things they do, in the way they're raising their children. Uh, the next chair is the contrary. And the contrary is the direct opposite of the committed. This is a person who is not actively pursuing a relationship with Christ. Now, let me clear something up, though. This doesn't mean they're a bad person. It does not mean that they're evil or horrible. They may be very moral, maybe more moral and good than most Christians are. But they're just not doing that in the name of Jesus Christ. They're not actively pursuing Jesus. They're not attending church or talking about God in their household. The last chair is kind of the in-between, and that's the convenient household. And the convenient household is the family that talks about, you know, well, we believe in church, we believe in God, but they attend once a month, once every couple of months. They're not regular attenders. They don't talk about God in their home. They don't actively pursue Christ in their weekly day-to-day -day life. It, in other words, God is a convenience, not an essential. God is not the primary driving force in the decisions that they make and the way they live their life. Now, According to what we know about studies, what studies are showing us is that children who grow up in this household, in the committed household, where parents are talking about God and living their lives for Christ as best they can, 70 to 80 percent of the children that grow up in this home will continue as adults to be this kind of home, okay? So more than likely, they're going to grow up and they're also going to be committed to following Christ and raising their children in a godly household. Now, same is true over here. The children who grew up in this household are 90% more likely to continue to stay and grow up to be in this household. They will not pursue a relationship with Christ. Again, doesn't mean they're bad people. They're just not actively pursuing Christ or attending church. But here's what studies are showing us that's very interesting. The children who grow up in this household, in the convenient household, they are 70 to 80% more likely to grow up and become this household. In other words, if they grow up in this kind of home, they will turn their backs on Christ and not raise their own family in a Christian home. They will live as atheists. And so it's very important for us to make sure that we, as grandparents, as parents, as people who are looking to have kids later on down the road, that we are living as committed followers of Christ in our home. Now, my question to you, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, is which of these chairs are you sitting in right now? Which kind of household do you have? And the next question is, which chair would you rather be in? Which chair would you like to move to? So the goal of parents, parenting is to train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, we want to take a, a few minutes and share some parenting wisdom with you. We want to echo what Proverbs says, because we want to raise happy, godly, successful kids. Uh, Proverbs kind of encourages a couple of different things. And the first thing that Proverbs encourages is instruction. Instruction. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Proverbs 4, uh, verse 1 says this. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Hmm. So parents, it is our responsibility to teach our children. It's our responsibility. Every aspect of life, values, education, life skills, integrity, the relationship with God, it is the parent's responsibility. The church, schools, uh, your, your friends, the community, they're all partners with parents, but parents are responsible to instruct their children. So what that means is that every single one of us will warp our kids in our image. Yep. Okay, we're, we're, we're all going to bless and we're all going to curse. Uh, so here's the, here's the questions then. What values are you teaching your children, your grandchildren? What manners and respect are you modeling? How important is a relationship with Jesus Christ to you? So parents, we're going to answer to God for what we teach our kids. Uh, Julie? Yeah, I want to talk to the kids in here. I know there's just a few of you in here, but if you're a kid, can you get, can you get your eyeballs at me? Here we go. Listen up. We're going to go back to this verse that says, A wise son hears his father's instruction. That pretty much means that a wise kid listens to and follows the direction of their, of their parents. Has your parents ever told you, Don't pick your nose. Stop biting your nails. Don't eat that extra piece of candy. Don't talk to strangers. Does that sound familiar, kids? I'm sure it does. You want to know why your parents ask you to do that stuff? Because they don't want you, they don't want your teeth to fall out, they don't want you to get stolen, and they don't want you to embarrass yourself in public. They're not doing it to be mean. They're doing it because they want you to learn the right way and not learn the hard way. They love you. I know that, for those of you that know me, this might come as a surprise, but I was a rule follower growing up. I listened to my parents for the most part. I made some mistakes, but I actually followed their directions. My mom and I were discussing last week. I was asking her, was I a pretty good rule follower? She said, absolutely, and you actually dodged some bullets because you listened. There was a time that my sister and I, and, or my mom, my sister and I went to France. I was 14, my sister was 17. And we were at a social gathering with some families. And there was this really cute guy named Sebastien. He looked, sounded, and smelled like his name. <laughs> he asked my sister and I to go out on the town in Paris this night. And we, my sister and I thought it was the best thing that had ever happened to us in our lives. And we were all excited. We went to my mom and we said, Mom, Sebastien wants us to go out in a night in Paris. And we said, can we go? And she looked at us and said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought she was the meanest mother we had ever seen. We truly did. We thought she was mean. She's just wanting us to be miserable. Because you hadn't seen the movie Taken. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but she could have saved our lives that night. And it was our choice to listen. And we choose to listen. And kids, I want you to understand that your parents love you and they're just looking out. You got it? Okay. And teenagers, the same is true. I know both of you are in here. I know where you're sitting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are teenagers in here. So, um, but teenagers, likewise, uh, please understand that your parents are not as dumb or dense as they appear to be. <laughs> they really aren't. Um, we've all been through the teenage years. We know what that's like. But teenagers, seriously, uh, your parents, your grandparents have lived life a lot more than you have. So they have experiences. They've gone through things that you haven't experienced yet. And they've learned from those experiences. And so my encouragement to you would be listen to what your parents would advise you to do. Just like uh, Julie's story demonstrated to us. The idea here is that you can learn from your parents and grandparents' experience in life. And so when you have questions or you have a decision that you're trying to make, 
go to your parents. They're a great resource. Go to your grandparents. They will be a great resource for you to start to navigate how to make that decision that you're trying to figure out because you can learn from their experiences. Uh, also, if uh, uh, teenagers come to you as parents or grandparents and share with you some of their struggles, don't freak out. Yeah. Don't freak out. Just, just go ahead and listen. Respond with grace. Uh, if you need help, then ask for it because uh, help is available. Uh, and, and so parents instruct. Uh, okay, that's one of the things that Proverbs tells us. We are responsible to instruct. And, and then secondly, Proverbs tells us that parents are to discipline. Discipline. Uh, the, I just thought I had music in my head going on. So... Uh, <laughs> I want to share with some verses with you that are out of Proverbs, and some of you will not be comfortable with these verses, and some of you will like them a little bit too much. <laughs> so, uh, Julie, you want to start us off? Yes, Proverbs 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 22, verse 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. <laughs> Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Verse 14. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. Literally hell. Yeah. Uh, parents, uh, discipline is significant. Even essential if we're going to raise godly, happy, successful children. Uh, and here's the why. Discipline teaches cause and effect. Discipline instructs kids that you're going to reap what you sow, that there's no way around that truth that God has built into the world. It's how life works. There are consequences to your actions. And then God entrusts children to us as parents so that we can teach our children discipline because that's how life works. If parents don't teach their children discipline, who's going to teach them discipline? The world. Yeah, the world's mm -hmm. going to teach them, and the world's going to be harsh. So it's, it's our opportunity as parents to, to love our children and to discipline our children because we love them. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse uh, 10 and, or 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. Yeah. So God disciplines us uh, to correct us and to lead us to life because he loves us. So discipline involves love and it involves correction. Not anger and punishment, but love and correction. Uh, now here's the reality. If you can discipline your kids when they're young, it's going to result in short-term pain and uh, unpleasantness. If there isn't any discipline when they're young, then it's going to result in long-term pain and negative life consequences. There's going to be pain either way. Might as well be short-term rather than long-term. So that brings us to the question of what is appropriate discipline because some of you like those verses way too much and some of you hated those verses, <laughs> wish they weren't in the Bible. Uh, so let me just say this. It is always wrong to beat or abuse a child. It is always wrong to abuse a child. I don't care what kind of abuse that is, physical, verbal. It doesn't matter. Uh, so just know that. And, uh, and we want to share with you kind of our philosophies of discipline where, where the place we've come to. Uh, again, let me restate, we're not perfect parents. There isn't a perfect way to parent. There are principles that are scriptural that we can use in our lives. Uh, so just for my family, Meralda and I, uh, we used corporal punishment. It wasn't the only kind of discipline that we used. But when uh, we used it primarily when our girls were young, like preschool young. Because when they were young, they learned to respect authority. They learned that disobedience hurt. Uh, and so there was no need for physical discipline when they got older. Uh, they understood that, that cause and effect. O.C., how about you? Uh, we use a multi-level approach. We use timeouts. We, uh, you know, ground him. We uh, take away privileges or take away items that are valuable to him. But we also use corporal punishment. Uh, but I can tell you, I can count on one hand how many times Knox has received a spanking in the last two years. Um, it's the last, in my household, it's the last resort type discipline technique. Uh, but as a counselor, as a former youth pastor, as a parent who studies uh, what to do, I've learned three things. And that's, first off, 
Uh, you as parents and grandparents, because this is a team effort to raise children and grandchildren, you as parents and grandparents need to have a plan. Uh, and it's better to have a plan before the kids are in the picture. That way you know ahead of time rather than trying to figure it out in the moment. The second thing that uh, I've learned is that the method of discipline is not as important as the way you enact that method of discipline. In other words, if you are not for spanking, which is great, um, if you just don't want to spank your child, but you send them to time out and you're yelling and screaming and cussing at your child, that's worse than spanking them. Because anytime you use emotional or verbal abuse to discipline your son or your daughter or your grandchild, you're doing more damage than good. You're hurting your child. You're not teaching them a lesson. They're not learning love and correction. Instead, they're just feeling your hatred. And so anytime that your emotions are playing a factor in how you discipline, you probably need to take a break from it. You need to step back. Um, anytime uh, that you're trying to satisfy your emotional desires in the moment, rather than showing your child love and correction, that's when you've stepped, that's when we've stepped over the line. And the third thing is be consistent. Uh, parents, whether it's the mom or the dad, or whether you're tired or energized, your child needs to see the same discipline that they would get day in and day out from either parents. Consistency is so important. If you've got a blended family, let me speak to that real quick. If it's at all possible for you and your ex to get together and formulate a plan, that will benefit your children so much because your children are going to learn very quickly which parent they're going to be able to manipulate and take advantage of. And so if you and your ex are able to sit down and work out a unified plan of discipline, it will only benefit your children rather than damage or hold back your children. Amen. Amen. Julie, how about you? Well, first off, it's not necessarily important how you discipline. It's that you discipline. There's not a one-size-fits-all method. Because if you haven't noticed, every child is very different. What? Yes. <laughs> they really are. They have different love languages, different pasts, different hurts. Some have special needs. There is not a one-size-fits-all. In my household, in my situation, we don't use corporal punishment for some of those reasons. And we find it more effective to have the timeouts to take away those special things. We never take away our love, and they know that we love them. Um, but we do take away other things that they find important to their lives. Um, children, I want to speak to you one more time. You are a gift from God. As a parent and as a mother, I want you to hear this. You are the most special gift to us. God chose us to be your parents for a special reason, and we wouldn't trade you for anything in the world. Your parent might be your mom or your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma or grandpa. Whoever we are, we love you, and because we love you, we discipline you. God disciplines those he loves, and therefore we discipline those we love. So I want you to remember that. We're not doing it to be mean. We're doing it because we're choosing to follow what God tells us to and because we love you. Hey, let me just take a moment and speak to grandparents because I am one now. <laughs> uh, the uh, grandparents support the parents in their discipline. Whether you agree with their method of discipline or not, uh, it's really important that you not undermine their authority or their discipline. You don't have different rules for grandma's house than applies to their house. So especially if your kids are trying to enact consistent discipline in their, in their children's life, don't undermine that. I know you think that maybe they're too harsh or maybe they're too lenient or whatever, but uh, respect and enforce their parenting. Uh, and, and some of us in this room need to apologize to our adult children for undermining their authority. And some of us in this room need to apologize to adult children for parenting from the wrong chair. Because confession is healing for all parties. Uh, which just brings me to this final closing question. Which chair are you living in? And which chair do you want to live in? 
and what are you willing to do to change?